Welcome to Something to Talk About from the Bainbridge Island Senior Community Center. I'm Reed Price. I'm the director of the center and three times a week, sometimes even more. We have get together topics here online and also occasionally in person uh, about it, items of interest. If you have a topic you'd like to see us tackle, give me a email at reed, R-E-E-D, at biseniorcenter.org. We're grateful to the folks at Fieldstone Communities of Bainbridge Island. Uh, they sponsor these programs on a regular basis, and they offer innovative and compassionate care on Rolling Bay. To find out more about their uh, facility, take a tour, or learn about respite uh, care or day stay, call this phone number, 360-689-4314. Also, I'd like to acknowledge that the Senior Center is on the ancestral homelands of the Coast Salish tribe, uh, the uh, Suquamish tribe, our neighbors to the north, and they are the people of the clear salt water. We are grateful for their hospitality and we honor them. Today, we're going to talk about housing, and the city is involved uh, with some support from some consultants on trying to put some uh, bones on a on an affordable housing plan for our community. And so uh, we have Sophie Glass here from Triangle Associates uh, to help us get started to talk about that. And so I'll just uh, turn over the microphone to you, Sophie. Great, thank you so much, Reed. And thank you to the Senior Center for allowing us to be here. Um, I wanna do introductions, but we'll just start with the team that I have with us. So Sophie Glass here, I am with Triangle Associates and we are, uh, a small woman-owned business that focuses on facilitation, community engagement, and really being the glue between policymakers and the people themselves. Uh, the co-owner actually lives on Bay Bridge, so we have that connection right there. Um, let's do Kim and then we'll do Jennifer. So go ahead, Kim. Hi everyone, my name is Kim. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a project coordinator at Triangle Associates and we'll be taking notes throughout the meeting. Yeah. So we've been uh, lucky enough to be hired by the city of Bainbridge Island to help on this housing action plan. And we have with us from the city, Jennifer Sutton. So if you want to introduce yourself, Jennifer. <clears throat> Hi, Jennifer Sutton. I'm a senior planner and my work often involves taking ordinances um, through the local, uh, the local legislative process through the Planning Commission and Council, and um, I'm the project manager for the Housing Action Plan Project, and I'm um, excited to listen in and be a resource for this conversation today. Yeah, thank you so much, Jennifer, for being here. Um, so Colleen, Robert, and Eleanor, can we just go around? It, it helps me so much as a facilitator if I know who is in the room. So maybe just say your name and how long you've been um, on Bainbridge for. So Colleen, go ahead. Uh, my name is Colleen Edwards, and I've been on Bainbridge for 18 plus years and a member of the Senior Center almost that whole length of time. Great. Great to meet you, Colleen. How about Robert? If you want to come off a of mute, Robert. So um, that, that uh, could be um, Robert or Barbara. Okay. And they've uh, they've been active in the senior yeah, center for quite a while. Okay, here we are. We're both of us are listening. Great. Great. And we are we are by the way celebrating our twelfth year on the famous Bainbridge Island. I wish it wasn't called Bainbridge since I got on that subject. I wish it was called another name. I don't really like the British the British uh, guy that's named after, but that's how things are, you know. Yeah, I haven't thought about that. Well, it sounds like it's Robert and Barbara. Robert and Barbara together, yeah. Okay, great. Nice to meet you both and happy dozen anniversary years on, on uh, Bainbridge Island. And then uh, Eleanor, if you wouldn't mind coming off and muted, introducing yourself. I took two actions to unmute myself. That's new. Um, hi, I'm Eleanor Wynell, and I have been on Bainbridge. Uh, I've lived here for just over five years. I've been visiting my cousin who's lived here for 20 some years. Um, I'm a member of the Senior Center um, a Board of Directors, and I'm um, interested in affordable housing. Great. Well, Eleanor, thanks so much for joining us. And I'll say that when we started this process back in the spring, we interviewed a few people on the planning commission and just kind of local leaders. 
And Reed, you'll, I have to let you know that your name came up in every single one of those conversations. And so it feels like a real full circle that we're wrapping up our engagement in the next week or two with this group here today. So for Great. I've been I've been here 26 years oh, and yeah. have been have been both a commuter and uh, and now uh, working here on the island. And uh, my wife has been an employee on Bainbridge on uh, Winslow Way, too, for that whole time. So uh, we've raised a couple of kids here and uh, uh, are trying to lure them back now. Yes, yes. Um, I can relate. I'm doing the opposite. I'm trying to lure my parents to me. And now that I, now that they have grandkids, it's working a little bit easier to bring them out my way. So uh, we have about, you know, 45 minutes, an hour together. And the first few minutes, we're just going to share information just to give the backdrop of the, the state of housing on Bainbridge. And then we want to really take the next 35, 40 minutes to hear from you all. So we have a series of questions. Um, this is a lot more fun when it's interactive. So I know not everyone is comfortable speaking up. So if you want to put your thoughts in the chat, you can do that. Um, but it's great to really actually hear your voices. My colleague here, Kim, is taking notes. And the notes are going to go to a big set of data um, that we were getting about um, from doing all of our community engagement. But it will only be at the theme level. So nothing that you say specifically is going to be attributed to you as like a quote unless you want that. And then you can tell us, please say to the council X, Y, or Z and put my name next to it. But otherwise, it'll just be themes. So let's just jump in. So first of, off, what is a housing action plan? And so a housing action plan is a plan that identifies actions that can help Bainbridge Island promote more housing availability and stability, housing diversity, so different types of housing, and affordability. And a few things come together to make this plan. Community engagement, so the work that uh, myself and Kim do. Data, the work that uh, a consulting firm Echo Northwest has really been lead leading. And a review of policies and existing plans that might be standing in the way of providing more housing, more housing choices, more affordable housing. So why um, did Jennifer Sutton and her colleagues say uh, Bainbridge needs a housing action plan? There are a few reasons, but we like tracing it back to in 2018, Bainbridge Island had an affordable housing task force. And I'll just read this aloud that um, in this task force, the finding was Bainbridge is becoming an increasingly exclusive and rarefied place to live. We are missing out on the vibrancy, creativity, economic benefit, and sustainability that a diverse population, diverse in age, socioeconomics, race, ethnicity, background, brings to a community. As a result, housing affordability is crucial both to those who live here and those who cannot. So as a result of this task force, Jennifer and her colleagues um, reached out, got some help to do this housing action plan. Um, throughout this conversation, we're gonna talk about affordable housing and the definition that the city uses and that most places in the US use is this very rough number that housing should be affordable that's roughly 30% of your income. So if you make $50,000 a year, your housing costs should be, oh, I'm so bad at math, 20%? No, terrible math, 15%, 15% of uh, uh, 15,000 of, of your total income. So that's roughly what we mean when we talk about affordable housing. So where are we in this process? Um, we are at the tail end of the first part of community engagement that focuses on housing needs and existing policies. So our conversation today is really gonna center on what kind of housing needs do you and your friends and relatives and neighbors need and what is missing on the island? And that will all get mixed up with some more uh, hard data and in the spring there's going to be a final housing action plan that's submitted to your city council. So before I talk data and charts and I reveal my bad math skills again, does anyone have any questions about what a housing action plan is? Why myself and Kim are before you today? Any questions? No. That sounds pretty straightforward to me. Yeah. So here are the, the facts and figures that tell a little bit of, of a story. And it sounded like 
Reed, you're the longest standing Bainbridge Island resident. So you could probably, you know, look back on the last 27 years or what have you. But, you know, you all have been on the island for a few years now, and maybe you've seen these trends yourself. So the first kind of fact that um, uh, has been uh, that the data shows with the recent analysis is that the rate of population growth has slowed down over the last 10 years. So while the total population from 92 to 2022 has increased, you know, the blue bars over there, the rate of increase has really slowed down. So the rate of increase has kind of been for the last few years between zero and 2% of a rate of growth. And so that followed a period in the 90s of it being more like a 6% growth rate from year to year. So just an awareness that the total population has grown, but the rate of growth has slowed. And then the, uh, this other piece is about age. And so this is why we really wanted to talk to seniors, is that we're recognizing that the island has increasingly gained older adults. And so in 2000, the average age was about 43 years. Um, in 2020, that, that rose to about 50, 50 years. And so similarly, about one in three people on the island are over the age of 60 today. But 20 years ago, that was... Um, 70% of the island. So I don't know if that rings true to you all, but th that's kind of how the demographic shifts are coming and why it is so critical we're hearing from you. We certainly have seen an increase in the membership of the Senior Center. Uh, yeah. And I think that uh, we also recognize that uh, we've seen this decrease affect things like schools, public schools, and other activities on the island. This yeah. relative ra range of population. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, we had a chance to talk to the superintendent and it was really valuable to hear his perspective on the school piece of it. Um, yeah. So we, we, you know, we looked at the rate of growth, we looked at um, age, and now just to look at income for a moment. And so again, looking back at, 20, at 2000, in 2000, about 14% of Islanders made over $150,000 a year in, in today's dollars. And today, roughly in 2020, that's more like 40% of the island makes over 150K. And so during that same 20 year period, you know, the, the percentage of wealthier, of higher incomes increased, but at the same token, the percentage of people making less money also decreased. So uh, people who earn under 50K per year, that decreased from 35% to 20% in that same 20 year period. So I'll just pause any reactions to this one reflections on whether this rings true or not so true. Okay, I got two more of these. So the next piece has to do with the sale of homes. And so, um, and some of you who have bought in the last 10 years, if you bought and you don't rent, this might look familiar to you. But uh, the sale price of homes has increased um, over the last uh, 10 years or so. And so currently, if you were to buy a, the average home in Bainbridge Island, it'd be 1.5 million. But throughout Kitsap County, that's more like 500,000. So roughly uh, three times that on Bainbridge Island. And we were asked at another one of these meetings, well, what is it for Seattle? Like Bainbridge is kind of unique. It's not, you know, far out on Kitsap, but it's not really Seattle. And just to note that roughly the average price of a home on Seattle was a million dollars in 2022. Just a cool million dollars. <laughs> So that's a sense of where the region is. Uh, any reactions to this one before we move to our last, the last uh, info chart here? Well, it certainly reduces the number of people for whom this housing is affordable if uh, it's 30% of their income is spent on housing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. That's true, okay. And then this is, uh, we looked at, um, population growth in that first one, this is about the growth of housing units. And so similar to that first chart, you'll see that overall the number of housing units, those bars, has increased over the past 20 years. But that squiggly line is the rate of growth. And you'll see over the last few years, the rate of growth of new housing development has been between 0% um, and 2% over the last, you know, five to 10 years. So that rate of growth has also uh, dwindled. So I'm going to pause and I'm going to see any reactions to that uh, last piece of information about housing growth before 
I do a little bit less talking. Okay. Well, um, I'd like to do what we sometimes dub a, a word waterfall now. So if you are comfortable using the chat, you can click that little chat button, looks like a word uh, um, talk button. And if you can just put in the chat, whatever words come to mind when I say affordable housing and Bainbridge, what do you just associate with that? And then we can kind of build a little bit of a waterfall here. No right answers. Let me tell you what I'm thinking. Yes. Affordable housing in Bainbridge. Um, my eldest daughter and I live together. We are under 50,000, well under $50,000 a year and cannot afford to live here. Uh, when she retires, we will probably move to a much more affordable place here in the United States. Even groceries are higher and gas are higher right here on Bainbridge they are, than they are in Suquamish or Palsbo or Bremerton, anywhere around there. And I think for those of us that can't afford it, we just can't live here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Colleen. So the kind of words that come to mind are unaffordable and you know required to move and those sorts of, that kind of pressure and the cost of living too. Yes. Yeah. And Eleanor wrote affordable, such a nebulous term, affordable for whom and for how long. Yeah, it is nebulous. And we're, we're trying to keep that one third of the income you have goes towards housing. That's considered affordable. If it's more than that, then you're really in that unaffordable zone. Subsidy are other words that come to mind. Mutually not compatible, affordable housing in Bainbridge. Yeah. Any other words? I think we've heard from most everyone. Great. Well, we have a bunch of more specific questions. It sometimes just helps me to see um, your thoughts. So sometimes this, this deck was built when we have like a ton of people in a room. So now that we're a smaller group, I don't need to be as strict with here are the rules. But I guess either in the chat, you can put a number or just say out loud, to what degree do you, uh, how much do you agree with the following statement? So here's the statement, people of all economic segments can find housing on Bainbridge that is affordable. In other words, cost less than 30% of their income. Um, no need to use the chat button. Just tell me out loud, do you agree with that? Disagree with that? What do you think? Disagree. Strongly disagree. Eleanor strongly disagrees. I heard another voice. Read, Colleen. yeah, go ahead, Colleen. Strongly disagree. How about you, Reed? I saw you come off the mute. Yeah, I, I put five. Strongly yeah. disagree. Mm -hmm. Robert and Barbara, any thoughts from you? We can come back to you. Looks like Robert put five or they both oh. put five in the chat. Thank you. I, I have one screen, which makes me feel a little bit like too many things happening at once. Yeah. I so, have screens piled on screens over here. So you just. I'm jealous. I'll borrow one of yours. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So the sense I'm getting from this group is that there's a real sense of importance and urgency around affordable housing on Bainbridge. And so I just want to hear the why behind that. Um, it seems like all of you felt like it was important. We heard a little bit from Colleen about, you know, the ability to stay on the island. But if you know, just come off of mute. I'd love to hear from all of you or, or, or why is housing so, housing affordability so important to you? Or um, if it's not important, you should tell us too, but you all said it was important. So yeah, jump in, jump in, Reed. So I, I think that, uh, that the community is richer. It's a more pleasant and wonderful place to live if you have a variety of people who are living here. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's only possible if you recognize that there are uh, disparities in the amount of money that people can put towards housing. And so you have solutions for people at a variety of different income levels. Mm -hmm. One of the things that at the senior center um, we like to do is to encourage, you know, interaction between people regardless of their financial circumstances, that this is a place 
to meet and play cribbage or line dance or go on a trip, uh, regardless of your financial restraints or lack of restraints. And um, that's only possible if you have places that people can live that recognize the fact that we don't all have the same financial circumstances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Reed, I'm hearing from you like community vibrancy, community inclusion. How do you how do you have a, a vibrant community? Yeah. Carly. Well, I think yeah. I think we run the risk of being, uh, you know, a very large gated community if the people who work here uh, can't afford to live here, mm -hmm. and that people who've lived here for a long time uh, increasingly cannot afford to live here. Um, and I'm thinking especially of retirees because most of us are on a fixed income. And um, I'm very lucky because so far I haven't been impacted by much in terms of my fixed income and it's my ability to pay for what I have here. Um, but I also understand that I'm, you know, I'm not the norm. And I hate to see people having to leave a place where they've lived for a very long time and a community to which they've contributed um, because they're being priced out of the place. It's just wrong. Yeah. So I'm I hearing that. Oh, who's jumping in? Colleen, go ahead. I totally agree. Yeah. So kind of two ends of the spectrum, right? You're saying if you don't work and you're on a fixed income, it's hard to stay on Bainbridge. And if you do work, and for many people, they have trouble affording to live on Bainbridge and work on Bainbridge as well, that there are some issues around that. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I mean, 30% 30, 30 of an income of $150,000 a year is one thing. 30% um, of an income of twenty-five dollars or $40,000 is a quite a different matter yeah. in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, what it means to people's ability to live. Yeah, and, and there are certainly seniors who would like to stay here, as Colleen was saying. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm thinking Colleen would like to stay here if she could. We certainly would like to have her stay. Yes, um, I would. <laughs> um, but also uh, a lot of the people that we see at the Senior Community Center are looking for assistance with uh, minor home repairs or housekeeping or uh, caregiving. And uh, people who do that kind of work can't afford to live here. Yeah. And there's uh, lots of opportunities to do that kind of work that from where they do live to here. Mm -hmm. And so it makes it very hard to um, encourage people to come and, and help uh, with that kind of senior support services uh, mm -hmm. when they can't, when they can't uh, make their own here. Uh, this is Barbara Golden. I like to echo what Reed has been saying. Uh, when we, in our community, when we had an emergency preparedness meeting um, years ago, the, uh, the guy who was the fire chief at the time said that if there's an emergency here and you need help, um, we'll be living someplace else. We don't live here. Uh, the people who are the helpers, the service people, don't necessarily live on the island, which affects all of us. Mm -hmm. So what we want our um, service people to live uh, next door to us and um, at least live, be able to afford to live here. So I'm just echoing what Reed has said and others. Yeah. From like a resiliency standpoint, how will the community be resilient if there's something in an emergency? If, um, yeah, thanks for that. Colleen, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, uh, when she was talking about pe the emergency people and all of that, I have had to use EMTs, as Reed knows, a number of times here on the island and not one of them lives here. The ones that mm -hmm. were around me live here on the island because they can't afford it. They do come in, they work like three or four days, whatever. Interesting. And so you've asked them that question, huh? Yeah. Oh, can we hear you? Yeah. Yeah, Colleen, you kind of moved away from the microphone, but. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, so it sounds like you, you've asked the question to the EMT people where they live, which is, 
I, I'm impressed that when you're seeking those sorts of services, you also have the presence of mind to ask that question, but that's really valuable for us to hear. Well, we would chat while I was in the ambulance going to yeah. the hospital. Yeah, I just love you. Got chatty in the, in the ambulance, yeah. Well, to your points earlier, we, we had the opportunity to interview the fire chief and the police chief about those same issues. And so, um, yeah, that, that, that's been surfaced before. Um, you all have touched on this to some degree, but just the question of how housing affordability or the lack of it has affected you, if at all. So I heard a little bit, I think from Eleanor saying that you've been a little bit um, buffered from, from that and Colleen, you and your daughter are looking about where you could live next from a affordability standpoint, but any kind of more of a personal reflection on what affordability, how has it affected you or your family, right? Reed, you were saying you're trying to get your kids to come back. Yeah, I, I think that uh, without um, some luck and good fortune, it would be really impossible for us not to try to figure that out. Um, we were, I also was able to move here at a time when the cost was significantly lower uh, to buy. And I also was at that time had a job that was paying more than this job. Uh, so that means that I was in a position to uh, sort of make the leap, which is just not open, would not have been open to me if I were trying to do that today. So I recognize very much what happens with many of our senior center members who feel like they are like Colleen being priced out of um, of of, live, live, of uh, housing here. Mm -hmm. So I've been trying to do things like I uh, spent some money to try to create a to create an ADU uh, in hopes that um, that can be a buffer for me in the long term to be able to stay here. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I feel like that kind of thing is the kind of combination of affordable housing that is sort of larger scope, like some of the developments that we saw in the late 90s and early 2000s, um, and uh, trying to do pocket changes here that would allow um, people to have affordability in a way that is across the whole island mm -hmm. um, without disrupting sort of that feel that we have of being a rural place. That's yeah. to me the, the the combination of those things is the way that we might be able to keep our um, what our feeling of what it's like to live on Bainbridge without um, losing what we used to have, which was a much more diverse uh, population. Yeah. So what is yeah, the role think, of those? Oh, go ahead, Colleen. Yeah, may I just say that we absolutely love living here. We have from day one. And we really do not want to leave. But you ask about how does the affordability or lack of affect us, if at all. We had a trip planned this year to go to Texas and Arizona to visit family. My younger brother, who is 83, <clears throat> and I'm 85, so maybe the last time that we get to see each other. We had to cancel that due to the cost of price, for, uh, price yeah. of gas, for one thing. We've had to watch out what we buy at the grocery store. I have refused some medications because they're too costly. Mm. That's how this has affected us. I, I do not have a car anymore because my daughter went from working nights to days. So I don't have a car, but I can't afford, even if one was given to me, to purchase the insurance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So all the things surrounding, I mean, it, it's the, the affordability crunch is that much bigger when housing is taking up so much of the income that you have. And so Colleen, your points about medication or visiting family or um, being able to have mobility on the island, those are all really real. And thanks, thanks for sharing those. Yeah, well, absolutely. You know, yeah. I, th I think too that this current um, rate of inflation, which we all know is exceptional and we don't know how long it's going to go on, but I think it's been, instructive to everyone as to how much difference it can make um, to have the price of everything increase by say 10%. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, if you're at the margin, I mean, that's where that, you know, sort of 
mythical 30% of income comes in. Um, if you're at a margin, that can be the difference, as Colleen says, between doing something or not doing something, eating or not eating, taking yeah. your meds or not. I, you know, um, I've been very lucky. I've not been on any prescription medications until quite recently. Um, but, you know, within a year, I saw the cost of a medication triple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And, and what I'm hearing is like, you have these larger societal forces of inflation, the cost of prescription drugs, the cost of gas, all these can be really compounding when you put that on top of housing. Yeah. Well, and I think gas, especially when, if you can't live where you work, you have to commute. And yeah. uh, virtually the you know, only way to commute here is by car. I realize there's public transportation, but uh, it's not like being in Seattle where there's, you know, a, a bus on a frequent schedule. Mm -hmm. It just makes it harder for people to commute. Yeah. Well, and uh, speak, I mean, we aren't really talking about transportation per se, but one of the things about uh, affordable housing is to be able to get a, get around from where you live to where you shop uh, or to where you are playing or socializing uh, easily and uh and so that's a part of, you know, if you're going to have, if you're going to have diverse locations, if you're going to spread out affordable housing on the island, like I was just suggesting, uh, part of the other piece of that is making it easy to get around mm -hmm. affordably, not, not adding a cost of transportation, of having to own a car or that gas or yeah. figure out where you're going to plug in your unaffordable electric car. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, housing and transportation are so intertwined. You know, they, could, there's a real relationship there. Yeah. Could I raise one more? Please. Which is related to housing, which is that um, I'm trying to figure out how to calculate this because I bought my house on a foreclosure, so it was less expensive than average. Um, I put money into it to renovate it, so it probably brought it up to what was the average then. It in five years time. It, the the assessed value has more than doubled. It's almost tripled. Wow. Which means, guess what else has tripled? <laughs> My tax, tax bill. Yeah. You know, and the taxes here are already high. I, I'm not complaining about paying taxes, honest. But to have that kind of jump in your in your tax bill in a year, um, again, if you're at the margin, is going to have a big impact. Mm-hmm. And that's, yeah. I mean, this talks about not just people who rent, but people who own are being mm -hmm. priced out. Yes, absolutely. We've seen that happen with uh, members of the senior center who can't afford uh, the taxes that uh, they could afford the house when they bought it, sort of my story, right? When it mm -hmm. was, when the house was not uh, valued at the level that it is now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a great segue actually into the next question here, which is about when you tried to find a place to live on Bainbridge, did you encounter any barriers? And so um, taxes can be a barrier when people are trying to figure out where they live, taxes, and you mentioned earlier, that even the cost of gas, there are other barriers. And so I guess for all uh, five of you, when you were looking for that first place here, any barriers that you, you came across? It sounds like you got a foreclosure, Colleen, but yeah, let's, let's hear about barriers to living here. That was Eleanor who got the oh, foreclosure. Eleanor got the foreclosure. I'm, I'm the lucky one. Okay, okay. <laughs> there were no barriers when we came. We, um, I, I really didn't want to leave Paul's bow because that's where my daughter um, works. But other than that, no, we mm. really enjoyed living here. I just love the senior center. Mm. Yeah. But get down there is nearly impossible. If I came down there every day, which I would like to do. I would have to take access probably mm -hmm. because it's really hard to get free rides even from IVC anymore. That's $2 each way. So you've got $20 a week there, which then you've got a month, you know, that adds up over over time and it's impossible for, for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even when you spoke about transit before, I don't know what Kitsap Transit is, but I know in Seattle it's two seventy five dollars a ride, so. Transit, transit is not always the more affordable option. Um, yeah, barriers. Yeah, let's hear other barriers. Well, a, a barrier that I 
understand, though I didn't really face it, is probably also the ability to get a mortgage. Um, I, I'm thinking about uh, someone I know who's been trying to buy property in Tacoma, and she's in her 40s and um, making a reasonable income, but not a lot, and um, a first-time home buyer. And you know, part of the problem is getting financing. Mm -hmm. And you know, I mean, a barrier for me. Well, I, the house was a foreclosure. Um, I had to pay cash. Mm -hmm. I could not have done that if my brother hadn't been kind enough to die and leave me some money. You know, mm -hmm. so you know that was not my plan. It was not his plan, but it made this work for me in sure. a way that it probably would not have otherwise. Mm -hmm. So the financing of home and in certain markets the need to actually have a lot of cash on hand to enter the housing market. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, just I troll Zillow, you know, periodically and mm -hmm. to see the anticipated monthly payment on a million dollar home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I should have asked in the beginning, are any of you renters? Because we could focus on the rental market too. Any Anyone renting here or all owning? Yeah. I, I rent. You rent, okay, yeah. Um, but you said that when you when you came to Bainbridge, you were able to find a rental unit when you when you arrived. Have you been in the same rental the whole time? Yes, over eight, eighteen plus years. Wow, and that's they, great. And they even took my three dogs. When they took home. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, two monkeys, which are big dogs. Yeah, I'm glad there's space for the whole family. Yeah, Robert, and we find we find a lot of people who are active at the center are looking for somewhere to rent. Mm -hmm. uh, but rental prices all over the country, but certainly here are astronomical unless you have the opportunity to make sort of a word of mouth deal with somebody. Mm -hmm. And and another, I mean, that's sort of when we think of the ADUs, I know people who are active at the center who live in additional dwelling units, smaller units um, that are associated with houses, either above a garage or mm -hmm. next door. Um Mother-in-law apartments, they're also sometimes called. Mm -hmm. um, they, those are all usually transactions that happen um, by word of mouth. And so if you aren't already plugged into this community, it's really hard to get a lead on mm -hmm. somewhere that might be affordable um, uh, for you because the rents are going to be otherwise, you know, $2,500 to $3,000 to $3,500 a month. Yeah. 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 That, that, that tracks with some of what we've been hearing about the extent to which people use Facebook or social networks to find housing because it's not, um, can't just go on a website and find it because a lot of it is like you were saying, word of mouth, but yeah, Colleen, go ahead. I didn't say anything. Oh, your box lit up. So sometimes I, oh, think I'm sorry. Gonna, you're fine. You don't do, you didn't do anything wrong. I just thought that I cut you off. Um, I'm going to keep moving us along because a lot of these questions are interrelated, but I want to hit all of them. So in the very beginning of this conversation, you talked about how people who um, work here should be able to live here, um, that when that isn't the case, their transportation costs go up and all those dynamics. But maybe we can spend a few minutes thinking about how housing affordability affects local businesses and workers. And I'll extend that beyond businesses because Reed, you mentioned the school district and others, but just local employers. How does it affect local employers? Well, I do notice that the hours of uh, the markets and some of the shops and restaurants are reduced, mm -hmm. probably because of difficulty having staff. Um, and um, and I mentioned earlier the idea of uh, if you are uh, trying to find a in-home care person, it's mm -hmm. difficult because this is a long way to commute to affordable housing, mm -hmm. and I'm sure I know that also affects. Um, we have a couple of for-profit um, um, senior housing, assisted living places on the island, and uh, their staffing is affected by that as well. Yeah, thanks for that, Reed. Yeah. That in conjunction earlier talking about um, EMS workers and other sort of um, police or fire personnel, but yeah, other reflections on how affordability and housing in general can affect 
I see Robert or, yeah. or, or Barbara said the crisis of housing is a national issue and difficult to get a handle on the causes behind the national issue when we grapple with this as a local problem. The prime barrier for us in considering residing on this island was a lack of racial and wealth diversity. Yeah. Thank you, so, Robert or Barbara. Yeah. That goes a little bit to what Reedy or say the beginning about community vitality and inclusion and diversity having, um, you know, a racial and income or racial and wealth aspect of that. Yeah. Any you know, other when, we, when we had a vibrant um, agricultural community here uh, several years back, um, and it's an important part of our heritage as an island and a history that we talk about a lot. Uh, in fact, we're going to be at the Senior Center doing a tour of Indipino life, Filipino and Indian uh, residents who uh, lived here. They were working in strawberry fields, an agricultural world that is, doesn't exist. And so uh, that, that agricultural community came with cultural diversity that hmm. when, they, when it left, we lost that or hmm. are losing it. I mean, there's still obviously an active Phil America, Filipino American hall. There's a vibrant Indipino community, but the, the idea of a community that can live uh, with agriculture as an income is, it's pretty much not here anymore. The, agriculture that we do have is pretty boutique-y. Mm -hmm. well, and, and another aspect of that was that I'm not going to pretend that it was uh, comfortable housing, but the agricultural workers were often housed where they were working. And mm -hmm. that sort of thing doesn't happen anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. That's a really interesting point about, you know, uh, the different trends on the island and across the country about the transition from smaller farms to more kind of industrial farming, so leaving behind boutique farms, but how does that affect the social makeup of the island? That's really interesting. Yeah, other thoughts on this before we have two more discussion questions. Yeah, we do have a farm near here off of 305 that has just built two tiny houses for their farm workers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so trying to find solutions on site. Yeah, go ahead, Jennifer. I was going to say that city owned farmland. Um, so the city contributed, I think friends of the farm, you know, managed uh, constructing the units, but that's, oh. that's city. <laughs> that's those. That's city subsidized. Farmland. That city, that's, that's a subsidized situation, which is interesting to note. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah. also, and also I'm thinking that these are probably uh, farm workers that are, uh, not going to probably be living here and raising children uh, for years and years. Correct. I mean, just the setup of that housing is more, at least I know, now I'm speaking somewhat out of turn here, but I do know about uh, farm uh, hiring practices where you encourage interns, people who are going to come for a year, learn about organic farming and, uh, and then uh, go off somewhere else as part of their um, their career or life process, mm -hmm. and um, and that's wonderful. Also different than uh, than the kind of uh, setting putting down roots, farming that puts down roots that I was talking about before. Great, a very nice pun right there for you, Reed. Yeah, Jennifer. Just while you had the microphone a minute ago, was there anything from your perspective as kind of a subject matter expert or the city that you would want to just respond to or acknowledge before we move on to our next question? No, just that I really appreciate everyone's um, really candid and thoughtful input, mm -hmm. and I'm glad it's being captured. Mm -hmm. I think it's. Yeah. I think it'll be good for the council and decision makers to hear, you know, real stories from real people, yeah. you know, about this problem that can sometimes seem theoretical. It's true, charts and graphs are lovely and all, but they don't actually um, wake people up the way a story does. So thank you for that. So uh, this is yeah. Barbara Golden speaking. Mm -hmm. I'd like to speak to um, affordable housing and why it's important. When we first moved here about almost 10 years ago, we, didn't, we had no idea um, really how wealthy the community was considered. 
until we started hiring people to come in and do things for us, like around the house. And then we started hearing stories about, I used to live on Bainbridge Island. I grew up here, but I can't afford to live here anymore. And there was so much resentment mm -hmm. um, that we started learning about how to respond to the resentment mm -hmm. of the people who felt like they were priced out of their home. Yeah. Uh, their hometown and their actual homes. Yeah. So what happens to kind of the social fabric or what happens to relationships when it comes to housing affordability or the lack of it? That's an angle that we haven't thought about or talked about much of these groups, but that interpersonal effect. Yeah. Yes. And, and also people have to consider um, what those outside the community think of you. And we started learning that people thought of this as a wealthy community, as a bubble community. And that's exactly what we were told uh, by people who didn't live here anymore. This is a wealthy community. I can't afford to live here. And that's a sort of, nobody wants that kind of resentment. Mm -hmm. But that's what we get because we're not very diverse here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Thanks, and, Robert. Yeah. yeah, and as as you pointed out in your graphs, uh, it's gotten more that way the, during the time that uh, we all have lived here, and that uh, uh, Robert and Barbara have lived here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, it was pretty eye opening to me to uh, read Jonathan Everson's book Lawn Boy because <laughs> uh, he talks about uh, being in the landscaping uh, industry yeah. uh, and and living on Bainbridge. Oh, interesting. I'll have to check that out. Well, with our 10 minutes left, I want to uh, touch quickly on two last questions. The first is, as the council is considering changes to Bainbridge in order to increase the amount of affordability, supply of housing, types of housing, it also wants to uphold to the extent possible what makes Bainbridge special and what factors are important to you and where you live. So maybe we'll go around and do that, and then we're going to wrap on a question that's more specific and kind of to Reed's point earlier about different housing types, the kind of the menu that the city has before it. So, yeah, let's just hear what what factors are important to you in choosing a place to live. I'll call on in the order that I see people on my screen, and we'll call on Reed first. What do you think, Reed? Um, well, I mentioned earlier the idea of diversity. Mm -hmm. and uh, um, sort of cultural richness, the idea that, uh, that you have an uh, interesting place to live. I feel like in many ways um, there are aspects of Bainbridge that, that recognize that, the idea that, um, you know, is there's kind of a um, Main Street activity when you find yourself on the first Friday of the month on um, – Winslow Way, you can run into people at during the art walk that you know, or um, the um, Halloween mm. uh, uh, event where the little kids are walking around in that same space on uh, on Halloween night. Um, I also feel like uh, the opportunity to um, be able to get out in uh, in the outside and have a pleasant place to be outside. And Bainbridge has done a very good job of reserving uh, open space. And I feel like there are great places to walk during uh, COVID. I was really grateful for the idea of uh, the trails that we have here mm -hmm. uh, when we could meet outdoors. And that proved to be a way to be safe and uh, also healthy. Yeah. Um, so I think that there are some things about Bainbridge that are uh, wonderful that way. Uh, but we risk them uh, by the... Um, by the trends that are already, as you said, well underway of um, reducing the affordable housing, the um, increasing the number of people, the price of housing here, uh, which probably given our location is gonna have to take some work by the um, government to uh, rectify that because market forces themselves are just gonna make it ever more you know, if I have a house that I am holding on to and uh, I have the opportunity to sell it or my children do, uh, it, you're going to have to 
depend on a lot of super compassionate people to think about how to convert that property into something that's permanently um, more uh, affordable or within reach for people. Yeah, or Robert or Barbara wrote subsidy earlier in our chat here just about, you know, if market forces aren't going to do it alone, what, what is the force that does it? Looks like the Goldens might be off mute. Maybe they have something to add. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, what's important to me, um, I echo, echo everything that Reed said. Uh, diversity is important to me and to our family. And by diversity, I also mean seeing children. Uh, we live in a community where um, there are very few children, mm. young children, mainly because I, I imagine young families can't afford to live here. And uh, seeing people with jobs, because we know a lot of retired people. And um, it's great living here with all these trees and all this outdoor space, because I like the fact that it's considered um, healthy to have a lot of outdoor space. But I wish more people could enjoy this. Mm -hmm. More people, you don't have to be um, elderly or high income to enjoy it. And uh, so mm -hmm. that's important to me. Yeah. But it's all that diversity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thinking about diversity from an age perspective and just the ability from as many people to enjoy what Bainbridge has. Yeah. Let's do Colleen and then we'll end with Eleanor. Colleen, go ahead. Um, just to, to I, for one thing, I agree with what Reed and Barbara both said. But when your question is, when you choose a place to live, which factors are most important to you? Right now, for me, it's at near medical services. And we've had a lot of those services leave this island. Hmm. So it's been very difficult to get sent to uh, the doctors that we need to see because maybe our insurance won't let us do that. And I fought with the insurance company. So now the company that I use allows us to go to outside doctors again. But still, you still have to go a little ways for it. We just don't have enough here. Mm -hmm. Access to medical services yeah. and all the rest. Yeah. Thank you, Colleen. And Eleanor, how about you? This is very dangerous. <laughs> um, I, I think it, in terms of uh, the factors that I look for in a place to live, there are two. One is community and the other is character. Mm -hmm. um, a, a character is an elusive term, but I, uh, in interest of full disclosure, taught architecture for 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was it was one of the issues that I, I tried to deal with a lot in terms of how do you define the character of a place? Um, and then how do you maintain that, even though you understand that tastes will change? And, you know, so it's not a matter of every house has to look like what's already there. It's a question of saying, for instance, the character of um, Bainbridge Island has a lot to do with trees and green and the feeling of being in, um, in the woods or in the country. Uh, or away from the, the density of urban life, except when you choose to go to town, um, it, you know, that there are ways of maintaining that that don't involve things like coming developers coming in and clearing the site of every tree, building their houses, and then, you know, planting one tree per house. Mm -hmm. um, community, I think, is part of that in the sense that um, a community is open. Community accepts all comers as it were and finds ways to accommodate them um, and, and to make life livable for them. I, you know, I, I'm also recently in the category of people who wanna see medical uh, facilities nearby. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I just, you know, I, I, I like the concentration of of town in town mm. and not spread out, you know, not a, a fast food on every corner sort of thing. And I think Bainbridge has done a good job on the whole 
of maintaining that, but I'm afraid we're in danger of losing it um, mm -hmm. because of the economic pressures. And, and this is, you know, this is the, puts the kibosh on everything. It, as long as everything is market driven, you're going to get, forgive me, I'm going to go off on it. You're going to get cynical developments like the wintergreen development that's, you know, calling itself affordable housing by putting housing on a road, busy, all of those things that nobody's going to want to live on. But if that's your, your income level, that's where you're going to live. So um, I think that, um, you know, that's a big impediment to all of these issues is what on earth is happening with the economy and mm -hmm. and a profit and a profit driven society mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i'm done sorry <laughs> no no you very well said very well spoken thank you eleanor yeah community character access to services profit driven development has its own ramifications um if you'll indulge me read i guess We'll do a lightning round of this question because I want to end on time. But this is a fun question for you, Eleanor, as an architect or others. But there, the city has a menu of different kinds of housing it can continue to build on Bainbridge to increase the supply. And we just, as our last question here, kind of a survey question, um, which types of housing do you feel like Bainbridge should really focus on? And you can put it in the chat or you can come off of mute and, you know, read, we heard from you about tiny houses or um, I guess a, a better term is uh, ADUs. But yeah, what types of housing should the city focus on or not? <laughs> well, I want to say all of the above sure. in the right place. That's a very legitimate response. Yeah. Who else? Colleen, go ahead. Well, I want to say number 11. I don't want to see any more housing. Mm. I don't want to see so much of this green taken away. The animals have lost some of their places to live. The birds, it's, it's you know, that that was one of the reasons I loved living here early on. Mm. Yeah. That's my, but that's just my own opinion. That's well, to, yeah, yeah, to my mind, I, you know, I think that uh, we want to maintain the character and, we want to try to keep as much green space as possible, which means that numbers uh, one and five are probably pretty hard to do. We've mm -hmm. maybe saturated the markets for one at this point, yeah. uh, and, and we should look for ways that we can take places that we've already developed and turn them into nine and 10 and three mm -hmm. and maybe two. Mm -hmm. I agree. That, that makes sense. Thanks for that. And then let's end with Robert and Barbara. Any thoughts from you? I like number three. This is Barbara. Hmm. I've watched a lot of uh, tiny house uh, developments on YouTube. Yeah. And, um, and I think that we don't do enough of that. Um, I like where we live. We live in a large house for the two of us with lots of space around. But I also like the idea of um, creating community with shared space, shared mm. outdoor space. I don't mean, um, you know, like the zero lot line houses. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, houses where you share some space. Everybody has green space, but not everybody has individual green space. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I think cottage housing often is that, that, that nebulous term that number two but um well I we're at time and I would be a bad facilitator if I didn't get you out of here on time so I'm gonna stop sharing um so thank you so much again for your time and I look forward to seeing you again hopefully soon and Kim you can now rest your fingers yeah seriously thank you Kim and thank you Jennifer take care Thanks. everyone